Great to see you again, Rob. And thank you for um, giving us your time to have a, a conversation about your career journey and the transition into the public sector. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you too. Thank you. If you could just give us a bit of a high level overview of your private sector career and then obviously the role that you've been um, working on in government for the last five years, I think it is now. I uh, was a management consultant working in Accenture for 25 years and uh, I had a very varied career there uh, working in advisory, uh, in technology and in outsourcing in a range of different sectors, but my career anchor throughout that was procurement and supply chain. I then uh, left and wanted a really uh, a big change to do something different, to do something with purpose uh, and to do something that uh, built on my skills. And so I uh, then moved to uh, the government commercial organization and a role as the chief commercial officer in HMRC. What was the thinking behind you wanting to make such a dramatic um, kind of change of direction from a private sector partner in a, in a big four consulting firm uh, and go into, into the public sector? I wanted to do something where I felt I was contributing to society in a broader way. Uh, and uh, I've been traveling quite a lot. So I think from a, a balance of life perspective, I wanted a, a bit more stability, to be able to work uh, in the UK, to be in a bit more control, a bit more of a um, uh, regular, repeatable um, sort of cadence to my working life. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that I had uh, a lot of challenge, uh, a lot of transformation, because I feel that that's, the variety of consulting was something I really enjoyed. So there's some things I wanted to change and some things that I thought would be uh, different. What are the most exciting programmes you've worked on in your time with HMRC? I think there are two or three that really stand out. Uh, doing work around the borders for uh, Brexit was really important work. Um, I mean, it's been a very calm time, let's face it, that you've been part of government. Yeah, I've yeah, enjoyed it a completely crazy time. And um, it's it's... Uh, really interesting seeing how smoothly the really complex systems in government worked pre-Brexit and to make sure that we made that transition and we did it with the support of third parties and um, working really closely with traders so they understood what was happening. So probably the most um, high profile piece we did was around the Northern Ireland Protocol, getting that up and running and working, placing a contract that enabled traders in Northern Ireland to be able to operate the protocol, yeah. uh, to, to transact through the protocol. So that was a, that was a really, a, a, a real high point. We also set up a, uh, a portfolio of uh, delivery centers up and down the country. So government hubs, these are buildings that occupy um, city centers. They have a consolidated workforce for from a, the regions up and down the country uh, in them. Uh, they house about 5,000 people apiece, and they are really modern um, work environments. So that was a big construction uh, project. Uh, it would have been challenging. I think we uh, we believe it's the largest project of its type in Europe, but also was delivered through Brexit. So at the point where we were in lockdowns, we had to keep that work going. What do you think the civil service offers that you know to industry um, career industry leaders? You know, what is unique about the civil service in terms of your experiences working and making that that, that change? I think the scale and complexity of pretty much everything I've touched has been mind blowing <laughs> um, um, and really un only unexpected. Uh, the multifaceted nature of changing government. Uh, so there's the supply chain challenge, there's the organisational capability challenge of getting something done in an organisation that's not always agile or motivated as an organism to, to change through competitive pressures. And then there's the transparency side, you know, working in a way that you can be held accountable to the public and it's, it's you know, a very high level of, of scrutiny that we face, including questions from MPs. Uh, and from the public, that is something I've not faced before. It makes you think quite differently about the probity of what you're doing, the transparency of it, being able to stand behind decisions in, in a public forum. And did that meet your expectations, Rob? Were your expectation managed? Has it surprised you? I think the, um, the public scrutiny part, I really didn't get before I joined. Of course, I knew there was public scrutiny, but the 
the depth of it, the care and attention that's paid to it, and the way it influences your thinking and actually can make you more risk averse. Um, I, I think I hadn't appreciated that. I don't think I really got into those sorts of conversations beforehand. Are there parts of your industry experience that you think actually that was a really good foundation that did translate really well to help you find your feet in government? The great sort of read across for me was working in um, financial services, which I did a fair amount before I moved across and being comfortable with a financial institution, being comfortable with the uh, types of suppliers, the types of contracts, the types of customer facing services that we provide made my life um, a, a, a lot easier than it would have been otherwise. Um, I think the project delivery skills that I had and the department I'm in, and I think most departments have this, the huge portfolios of change that they've got um, meant that it was very familiar to me, but I could also add a lot of value with colleagues by describing my previous experience of similar sorts of situations even if what we were delivering wasn't exactly the same as I'd done in the private sector, the principles of being clear about the mission, um, having a realistic uh, planning time scale, getting the right experts to support, being open to suppliers ideas and not just believing we've got all of the right answers. Um, all of those sort of things translated really well. Clearly, at the moment, there is so much macroeconomic and political turmoil that we are all living through on a daily basis, it feels at the moment. How do you think that impacts your role as a leader, both leading your existing teams, but also that kind of maybe credibility with the supply base? Does the external political um, yeah, turmoil, I think is probably the only way to describe it. How, how, does, how does that impact your day to day role? But in a number of different ways, I think from a personal resilience perspective, having the ability that almost the mental discipline to separate yourself from the decisions that are being made politically, and be really focused on delivery is, is critically important. Mm -hmm. um, the readiness to change. Um, so we've had a few instances where we've worked on a thing and uh, we've had to sort of park it. Uh, and go in the opposite direction. And I've been used to that from the consulting world. Sometimes an Client initiative just changes their mind and just goes in. Work. Way. So, and you're really prepared then to say, okay, fine, directions change, let's just get on and do that. As a leader, I found keeping the morale of my team up when things are happening, particularly criticism of civil servants, that's been a really big thing for us yeah. because we've been working really hard and we've been doing some quite difficult things that we're quite proud of. And on occasion, we will get, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the media, a sort of a, what I would regard as a misrepresentation or a characterization, which is hard for people to cope with, um, to feel pride in what they're doing, to feel valued. So that's certainly been something I've had to do with, uh, with the folk around me to keep their heads up, to actually, again, use my experience to say, you know, what you've done is as good as organizations I've worked with in other sectors. So whatever the, you're reading in the papers, you know, you get it from me. I'm a very experienced person. I can tell you that this is good. Um, I'm also not hesitating to tell people where things aren't quite up to scratch and sort of point that out. But I think that's that's something that about being in the civil service and facing those changes uh, and um, opinions that are, that are that are sort of foisted on the civil service. That's a big part of the job. Exactly. And, and it's been a tough kind of what four or five years, four years for everybody really through the pandemic and particularly in supply chain with the inflationary pressures and commodity shortages and energy prices. It's kind of relentless. So that ability to for all of us to build that level of resilience and recharge our own batteries is is critical and have that air cover from from your leader um, to keep you all um, kind of motivated and, and feeling like you're valued. Yes. And I think the I think the quid pro quo for me through that period of turbulence has been in a way the stability of the civil service and that we are not closing operations we're not in a competitive situation where we need to do you know quite tactical things to survive for bottom line reasons so I found my team has been quite well funded throughout um, generally budgets have been stable so, you, so whilst the mission sometimes changes um, you are able to plan against that mission and do your best to deliver it. Mm, that's really interesting. What's been, what are the best bits for you when you look back over the last five years? What are the real key highlights? My first um, uh, session with the team, I got the whole of my team together 
and we created a five year plan together, all at sort of tables in a conference room. And I wanted to make a real effort to get everyone involved for it not to be tablets of stone for Rob that they would all follow, which is a little bit of a, it's a potential trap to fall into as a senior leader in the civil service. People are really prepared to just um, take what you say and follow your plan. And we did a great job of kind of creating a, a plan that the whole team could see their fingerprints on. That was a, a great moment for me. I think in uh, Brexit, the New Year's Day 2021, Northern Ireland, watching the telly, and wondering if there'd be a load of lorries uh, and uh, you know some bad headlines and just seeing it all work and all the plans that we put in place, the hard work, that mm -hmm. was a huge highlight for me. Do you see your future in the civil service? Do you see this move has strengthened your future if you choose to go back into the private sector at any point? I'm trying to keep an open mind about, about those things. I think because of my background, um, I think this has really strengthened my, uh, broadened my options. I think I'm now proven my line uh, management capability. I've done it in an environment which is quite challenging. I think there's some obvious, um, it's a recognizable delivery stories that I can tell. And I think I've done it in an environment which is really challenging to get things done. So I think I've got kind of good story in terms of being able to go into any sector. And I tend to think about my next role from a non-sector perspective. Mm -hmm. um, which I came into this with actually, I didn't come into this role as I, I want to work in the public sector because I want an exciting role with these features. What advice would you give somebody based on your experience? And I know people come to you and they ask you whether they, they think like, what you think about should they move and join the civil service or not? What advice do you give when they're considering it? I think I don't have sort of generic set of advice. <laughs> so, that, so I do talk to people about, about this and I always want to understand what they're motivated by and what they... Um, I guess what their levels of patience are for working in an environment which is not straightforward. So if they're able to deal with the complexity, the um, decision-making overheads, because there's quite a lot of governance, so having to go to different groups to get consensus to be able to do the thing, and then to keep going back to them to reaffirm that you're still doing the thing and doing it in the right way. I think if... Uh, you, you have confidence in your capability and you want a challenge and you want that sort of purpose and, and purpose isn't the sole preserve of the civil service but if you want purpose you'll find plenty of it there if you've got all of those things and you've got the personality profile then I'd say that's a really good combination yeah no that makes a lot of sense Rob thank you so much that's been really interesting just to kind of chat with you um over your own experiences and motivations and learnings and, and how much you've enjoyed it and I'm sure um others considering a move into public sector will be intrigued um to hear what you have to say so thank you very much good talking to you